Good day, ladies and gentlemen. First, I want to thank all fans, both past and present, for their endless support of this channel. Without all of you, this video would not have been possible. The role-playing game is one of the most unique forms of entertainment currently devised. It is simultaneously a novel, a movie, a TV show, and an imaginary life. No other type of entertainment even comes close to what a role-playing game can offer. The role-playing game is a form of entertainment that is by far the hardest to create, for it is longer than a movie or a TV show and has graphical depictions where a novel has none. It requires talent, passion, pride, and that special sauce that comes from those who can truly create. Today, we are looking at the Paragon of RPGs. In the year 2007, Bioware Corp introduced us to a world filled with complex and memorable characters, a world of wonder and excitement. The humans of Earth call it the Mass Effect. Mass Effect was developed by the legendary Bioware, or as they were known at this time, Bioware Corp, and published by Microsoft Studios in the primordial days of 2007. At this point, this was an exclusive for the Xbox 360, and at that point, the Xbox was a mere two years old. Bioware, by this point, had made a major name for themselves due to their legendary releases such as Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood, and a few lesser known games such as Baldur's Gate and Knights of the Old Republic. It's kind of crazy to think that Knights of the Old Republic came out only four years prior to Mass Effect, and in that four year time span, graphics, gameplay, and voice acting was an order of magnitude better. That was how fast things went back in those days. I personally never followed gaming news, so I was not primed to buy Mass Effect, but when I heard that the developers of Knights of the Old Republic were making a new game, I pre-ordered Mass Effect, and thankfully, 16 years ago, pre-ordering really meant nothing more than showing one's excitement for a game. You didn't get in-game DLC or bonuses that broke the game, you didn't get exclusive characters, you just got the game, maybe with some little cheap collectible. I got a DVD with some behind the scenes stuff on it, a cool little extra that has nothing to do with what is in the game. This means that Mass Effect was complete on disc. No extra content hidden behind a paywall, no nothing but the game you paid for. While the game started out as an Xbox 360 exclusive, it would later be ported to the PC by Demiurge Studios in 2008, and later the PS3 would get its own version in 2012. And finally, in 2021, Mass Effect 1 and by extension the rest of the trilogy would be remastered and re-released as part of the Mass Effect Legendary Edition collection. Today, we'll be looking at the 360 version of the game, the same game I played way back in 2007. While in the space future of 2023, box art doesn't really matter, back in the old days, a game's box art had to sell the game. So let's take a close look at what an unsuspecting player would have seen as their first experience with Mass Effect. In 2007, a video game cover could still be a work of art, could still be something that one could hang on the wall. And this cover here is definitely a wall hanger. The font used for Mass Effect is suitably distinct from other sci-fi franchises and gives the name Mass Effect its own identity. We have our first look at Commander Shepard himself, the main player character in distinct armor that would change as the series progressed. Most notably, the shoulder pads would change between games. We have a starship in the background that would be this games USS Enterprise slash Evan Hawk, and we have two distinct characters flanking Shepard, a female in sexy armor and a cool alien dude. The villain is placed over the title logo so that it appears that he is looming above all. My only issue with the cover is that it's a little too busy, a little too much stuff going on that can cause one to lose focus. Flip it over on the back, the back of the box actually tells the truth. If anything, the game undersells itself as it doesn't mention that your player is fully voiced or that you will have a mostly controllable vehicle. All told, you know you got something good when even the box is top tier. RPGs and gameplay have a rather, shall we say, adversarial relationship. You can have the best story ever, but if the gameplay sucks, you aren't going to have a very good time playing it. RPGs usually had very in-depth gameplay that required a 20-page manual just to open a menu. And what gameplay there was, was usually punishing to say the least. And you'd better have known how every stat worked. Oh, and if you missed one easily skipped item, the whole game could have been hosed. 
Some developers tried to make an amalgamation of RPG and action game, but this usually just left the story on the cutting room floor. The masters at Bioware, not content with making turn-based gameplay fun in KOTOR 1, decided, well, let's make a game that is as complex as a classic RPG, but have it be fun and easy to pick up and play. And that's what you got here. You got full RPG gameplay, as in it's more complex than open door and shoot bastard, but all of it is 100% understandable, and you know what to do when the time calls for it. Mass Effect 1, like the rest of the series that would follow it, takes place from the third person perspective. You get two different camera views. For non-combat, the camera is pulled out so you can see more of the environment. So you can steal, I mean, uh, 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 expropriate things for the honor of Earth and all her colonies. Then you got the combat camera. This zooms in and allows for easier aiming. This two-tiered camera system is such a godsend, you gotta wonder why other bloody games didn't and don't do it. Combat itself is in real time, but you can pause the game to issue orders, and this is where the Masters of Bioware really got the RPG gameplay right. Never before or since has the act of selecting you and your party members' powers felt this dynamic. Usually in RPGs, you queue up powers and then finally launch them, and this usually takes the form of pause and attack gameplay, and this can get really tedious at times. Here you do pause the game to select powers, but it is much quicker and much more dynamic, and you can quickly select you and your party members' powers with just the flick of a joystick. Far be it from being fun just on a console, this is great on the PC too, as it requires much less tedious selecting by the player. You can fire off one power per pause, and each power has its own cooldown, and this is by far the best power system in the goddamn franchise. Now, in addition to powers, you have the third person shooting gameplay. For all the good of the powers, the third person shooting elements feel a bit stiff in places, and the controls are a little weird as well. As this was 2007, you had to hug the wall, and it would sometimes be a bit awkward to do so. The actual shooting was fun enough, although I am more of a power player myself, and seldom had to deploy a bullet shooter. What this third person shooting allowed the player to do was have a more dynamic gameplay mode that would vary up the gameplay from just select power, kill everything, slash repeat. You get a number of different weapons and you carry all of them on your person at one time. This is a true RPG. Unless you are trained on a weapon, you can't use it. Oh, you can deploy it, but you can't hit the broad side of a space barn with the space door closed. This makes what weapons you can use that much more special, and ensures that your character class has meaning. You can upgrade your weapons and armor, and for the shooters, you can use certain bullets, and the enemy can also use certain bullets as well. And you can get poisoned during combat, and that will slowly drain your health. The best bullets in the game are the incendiary rounds. They set enemies on fire. Make sure you give all your party members the Bernie bullets and cleanse the galaxy of the unclean in holy fire! In addition to the on-foot gameplay, you have the Mako. And trust me, that name is more than apt. For those that don't know, Mako is an auto body repair shop. I personally went there to get my car repainted and they did a great job. And here is hoping they still exist in the future, cause Chef's gotta go there, cause the Mako is gonna need some new paint. Oh, the Mako. It is the most memed aspect of Mass Effect 1, and most of the memes are rather unfair. I don't hear anyone complaining about how shat the Warthog was back in Halo 1, or how it was shat again in the Halo Master Chief Collection either. But seriously, the Mako is maligned for being weird to control, and I will admit it is a touch floaty. But you know what, lads and lasses, back in the day when we got weird gameplay, we bloody well figured that bastard out and had fun instead of writing an entire novel about how horrible the control is. In Mass Effect, the game world is not seamless. Instead, you load into individual maps, some large and some small, and a major aspect of the game is the planetary exploration, which is inspired by the classic game Star Control 2. The planetary exploration is facilitated by the Mako, and without it, all you'd get are small linear levels. Thanks, Mass Effect 2! While the Mako can be hard to control, the planetary exploration really makes you feel like you're seeking out new life and new civilizations and boldly going where no one has gone before. Never before or since has this been so bloody fun. The Mako is armed and has a big, 
bloody gun and a not so big damn machining gewehr. You have some shields and armor and you can take a lot of damage on more sane difficulties. You even have jump jets that allows you to get around slightly faster or to get yourself unstuck. What's even cooler is that you can get out of the Mako at any time and walk around. And sometimes when the Mako's on fire, you can get out and fight the alien and not be afraid of anything. And really, the Mako makes the game feel much bigger than its successors. And in addition to all the cool aspects of it, you can even fight space graboids in it. As befitting its true RPG status, the game is tough even on normal difficulty. You can die and die easily in this game. You have shields and a health bar and a very limited stock of healing items and the game does not heal you between missions. So if you're at like two points of health and poisoned, I guess Shep just chats with his bros while dying. Balls of titanium A on that man. When you heal, you don't heal fully and on the original 360 version of this game, you have a 60 second cooldown between heals. Hard bloody core, but doable with just a little skill. One other element of this game that is often lambasted is the inventory. The inventory for the original Xbox 360 version has been as maligned as the Mako, but it's really fine. I've played both the original PC version and the legendary version and their inventories aren't any better. In the original 360 version, you cycle through your crap till you find what you need. What more do you want? Unlike in past RPGs, you auto-loot the bodies, and it's not hard to amass a bunch of shisa to sell or break down into Omnigel. Oh, Omnigel, how we miss thee. You use Omnigel to fix up the Mako and to open up certain objects, or to potentially finish a quest. It's good stuff and makes the game that much more complex. You get better weapons by killing people or by taking the looted weapons and selling them for big bucks at shops. In a nod to not wasting your time, there is a shop on the ship that you can buy and sell from. But this is a big curvaceous bum you have to find or buy licenses for products that you want to buy from the ship shop, thus making buying stuff that much more satisfying. There are also little gameplay bits to be found throughout the game, there are time segments here and there, and they have fair time limits. They are just short enough to make the player shout, oh shit, oh shit, instead of, ah, screw the game. The game also features QTEs. It's weird to think that in the space future of 2023, that the quick time events have been with us almost longer than they weren't. And since their inception, they have been a bit uh, divisive. For lazy devs, they're great. That means that the lazy devs don't have to program in actual gameplay. For the masters of Bioware, they give them one more dimension for gameplay. In most RPGs, you have a lockpick slash security skill that allows you to loot chests and the like. This can range from the basic click on a chest and open it to the lockpick minigame in Fallout slash Elder Scrolls. Mass Effect uses skill checks and QTEs to make looting chests fun. A QTE done well can enhance the gameplay rather than detract from it. To open up chests or hack things, you have to have a high enough skill and complete a minigame. This minigame is easy enough, but you gotta be fast and precise to open any chest and you only get one chance, cause if you fail, you either have to move on or use some Omni Gel. Yes, the masters of Bioware made opening chests fun, but that's not all. They even figured out how to make plot relevant events that would not easily be done in third person shooters playable. The QTEs show up for segments where you gotta do something like synthesize a cure or program a space coven. And while it is a simple little thing, it ensures that you are controlling Shepard when you want him to do something. Mass Effect 1 features boss fights complete with health bars. Some will be on foot and others will be in the Mako. They can be a challenge or can be easy depending on how well you know the game. The galaxy map, ladies and gentlemen. Not only does the music sound groin-grabbingly transcendent, it allows you to feel like a true space adventurer. In Mass Effect 1, when you want to go somewhere, you just select it and you go there. In later games, there will be more to do here. The galaxy map really does set the stage for what kind of game this is going to be. As a true RPG, you get a bunch of character classes and each one matters and is distinct. However, there is one minor issue. The first class you can choose is the rather mistakenly named Soldier Class. The Great Commander Shepard is many things. Savior, lover, and all-around badass. But what he is most assuredly not is a soldier. Commander Shepard is a crayon-eaten, hard-charging marine. 
and the marine class, as it should be called, is the class where you get all the guns. The only problem is it's a little boring compared to the others. You got the engineer, aka nerd, the adept, aka mage, infiltrator, nerd with a sniper, vanguard, mage with a shotgun, and finally my favorite class of all time, the Sentinel, aka the Nerd Mage. The Nerd Mage is the best class in the entire game. You can use Techno Sorcery as well as Regular Sorcery, aka Biotics. So the Nerd Mage can shut down his enemy's weapons and shields and then throw distorted space time at them. Yeah, he can't use heavy armor or any other weapon other than the pistol, but why would you need any of that when whatever a Sentinel sees he destroys! The level up system is exactly what you would expect. You get XP from completing quests, evaporating bastards with magic, or um, shooting them if you're a lame -o, and completing little mini objectives here and there for tiny bits of XP. You have a good number of levels, and you don't really need max level to be a total combat beast. Well, so long as you play as the nerd mage. Unlike in later Mass Effect games, what stats you raise actually matter, and you're not given all the easy powers from the get-go. You start out as a squishy boy, and you have to earn your superpowers. Even something as simple as raising a companion from the dead is something that has to be unlocked, and there is no respect to be found. You'd better think twice about what you select, as you can really screw yourself. As befitting a true RPG, you get a wide variety of companions, and these companions are awesome! in terms of story at least. Their AI leaves something to be desired as they will shoot walls and run straight into enemy fire. But with a firm hand, one can get them to be death incarnate. You can have two bros with you at any time, and at different parts of the game, some can die. The different companions will have their own strengths and weaknesses, with my two favorites being the sexy blue babe Dr. Liara Tassoni and the big bro badass or not Rex, we will most assuredly cover them more in the story segment. At the end of each plot mission or side mission, you head back to your ship for downtime, and you get to talk to everyone. You will learn more about their lives, and you will get side quests. The companions are a little simplified compared to Knights of the Old Republic, as in that game, you did much the same, but your companions would build stuff for you. Ah well, Liara's blue booty is all I really need. The game tracks morality via the Paragon slash Renegade system. How you act and talk will give you Paragon and Renegade points. Depending on how many points you have in either one of those categories, you will get different dialogue options. Paragon can be summed up as sane person, and Renegade can best be described as asshole, or sane person depending upon the choice. What you choose in terms of Paragon and Renegade does matter, because there will be several instances in the game where you will need to have a high enough Paragon or Renegade score to make a certain choice. You can continue with the dialogue if you don't have enough points, but usually you will get an unsatisfactory conclusion. This means that the talking in the game is much more satisfying as you have to play the game in the right way so you can say the right thing. How you play the game does have an impact on what you can say and what missions you can go on. If you kill an entire colony instead of saving them, people will be less likely to help or trust you. Never before or since did the Yakin feel so real. This is a major upgrade on what we saw in Knights of the Old Republic, and this is actually somewhat improved upon in Mass Effect 2. Lastly, you got the grenades. I mentioned it at the very end because as a nerd mage, I never use them except for one mission, and I guess the best you can say about the grenades are they explode. As you would expect from a game of this excellence, it looks as amazing as it plays. What I want everyone to keep in mind is that what we're looking at is a game from 2007. We have no high-res texture packs, we have no remastering, we just have the game as it looked back then. Holy crap, ladies and gentlemen, has Mass Effect been able to maintain its graphical fidelity. Very few games from this era still look as good as Mass Effect 1 does. And also keep in mind that this is only four years after Knights of the Old Republic 1. Now in 16 years, the game has aged, no doubt about that. The textures lack overall detail in places and the animations are a little stiff. But that is offset by the amazing facial animations that were nothing short of a thing of 
beauty in 2007, and still today, we went from mouth flaps and KOTOR to this. This aided in the overall immersion as the characters felt alive and not like action figures. Following on from Knights of the Old Republic, we still have cinematic camera angles during the conversations, and these work really well. They accentuate the dialogue, and I never had one where you just zoomed into a guy's head or were facing a wall. Sadly, later Mass Effects couldn't make that boast. A decade later in Mass Effect Andromeda, the faces were tired, but in 2007, they were filled with life and vigor. Sadly, you couldn't have a game this complex and expect Sweet 60 all throughout. You're doing good to get 30, and sometimes not even that in the large areas. Sometimes, in a really complex area, the game just freezes when a character talks. I'm running this from the SSD and the Xbox 360, so the infamous loading times are not present, but they did take a bit back when the data had to be streamed off the disc. Honestly, I never cared as during those times I had a chance to get a drink or hit the bathroom. Since this was the early days of the Xbox 360, we have a very low screen resolution to the point where it seems like old ship has eyesight about as bad as mine. In spite of the weak textures and low resolution, the lighting is really bloody good and still looks good today. These days, ladies and gentlemen, games usually have more patches than my bloody clothes, but what we're looking at here today is a completely unpatched version of Mass Effect 1. This was the game that shipped on day one in 2007. And unlike with certain other games, <coughs> Fallout New Vegas, it does not require any patches to be 100% playable. Now that is not to say that Mass Effect 1 unpatched is 100% perfect. I got a save error on an away mission and I gave thanks to the almighty Omnissiah that a save in a different slot was not too far back. But other than that, the game didn't crash and I got no bugs on the various quests. Masterpiece, indeed. I've played both the original PC port of the game and the Legendary Edition, and yes, the graphics were better in some areas and weaker in others, as some of the graphical elements in both ports are downgraded somewhat compared to the Xbox 360 version. Some of the little details were skipped in the original PC port of Mass Effect, and in the Legendary Edition, the facial animations are reduced in complexity for whatever reason. The Legendary Edition also simplifies some of the minigames and removes others entirely, and replaces the original HUD with the Mass Effect 2 HUD to the game's detriment. And there are a few other annoying changes here and there as well, but despite all that, the modern day Legendary Edition port is still a good representation of what Mass Effect was meant to be, and is the version I recommend if you want the basic Mass Effect experience, and is the version I recommend if you want to get new players into the franchise, as you can just buy it and have all three games with no fuss or must. Hopefully as time goes on, the Legendary Edition on the PC can be updated by modders to return the cut or modified content and possibly fix the simplified graphics as well. As of this recording, the definitive version of Mass Effect 1 is still the original PC port with mods as it keeps all the gameplay intact and can be updated with mods to make it look even better than the Legendary Edition. As the original was a 360 game, it was designed with a controller interface in mind and by the great space dragon does it control well for a game this complex. You would think that the controller just wouldn't cut it, but the masters of Bioware made the game work with the limited buttons and in doing so made it a very efficient game. It doesn't need an entire keyboard and thus ensures that the game does not get tedious to play. You most assuredly do not need a 50 page manual to open up the bloody inventory here. This game controls so bloody well that one wonders why games that are not nearly as deep as this game need all those bloody keys to play. On the PC, the game controls well with keyboard and mouse, but the 360 controller will always be my champion. Opening up Mass Effect for the first time is an experience. You start the game and you see the earth hanging below when the wistful, hopeful, and haunting tones of Virgil's theme begin playing. It is a piece of music that stands out not just in gaming, but in music itself, as one of the best themes of all time and as memorable as the Star Wars theme itself. It is a slow and understated theme that, depending upon context, can be sad or hopeful. For the first time player, it is a promise of strange new worlds and epic adventures. With but one button press, you hear a single tone that rings in wonder. The soundtrack and sounds in general stand out from the series as a whole, and in gaming in general. Every song is nothing short of amazing, even the looped music. I could listen to those beats eight hours straight and still not get sick of them. The level up theme is a thing of beauty, and how even the bloody bloops are a feast for the ears. 
Mass Effect 1 has two themes. Virgil's theme, this one will play during the emotional moments in this game, and its sequels, and then you have the main theme for the game, which plays after character creation. It's more bombastic and really gets the player pumped for epic space action, and it crescendos to a sound effect, and that sound is the mass relay flinging the SSV Normandy at superluminal speeds to another part of the galaxy. The mass relay itself would never sound as good as it does here, and by and large most of the sounds were at their very peak in this game. Although thankfully, each succeeding game's theme would be on par with the theme present in Mass Effect, with Mass Effect 2's internal theme being my favorite in the series as a whole. Prior to Mass Effect, the RPG protagonist was mostly silent. You would select the dialogue, but the player would be mute. This made those games much less immersive for it. Mass Effect gave the player a voice. In Mass Effect, you can choose between male and female Shepard, with male Shep being voiced by Mark Muir and femme Shep being voiced by Jennifer Hale of KOTOR fame. Both turn in excellent performances and make Mass Effect one of the most immersive RPGs to date. But the other actors and actresses are no slouches either, and what we have here is cinematic quality voice acting across all the important characters. Yeah, there are a few bad voice actors here and there, but they are few and far between. What we got are a bunch of big names. We got Marina Sturtis of Star Trek TNG, and your boss Admiral Hackett is voiced by the one and only Lance Henriksen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to delve into what might possibly be the greatest video game story of all time. Are you ready to enter a sci-fi adventure unlike any other? Are you ready to don your helmet and go feet first into hell and enter the world of the Mass Effect? Well, if you're not, then this would have been all overdramatic for nothing. So now we are on to the story segment. It took nine bloody pages just to talk about the fundamentals. You can bet it's going to take even longer for me to talk about the story. So take a pause here if you need to, or if you're at work and listening to this, then get ready for the day to just fly by, because we have got a lot of ground to cover. Mass Effect was one of the first games to really show that games could be more than just a child's interest. Oh sure, there were GTAs and Fallouts of the past, but what Mass Effect did was show that gaming had reached a point where it could meet and surpass movies and television. Mass Effect 1, and by extension the rest of the series, could be best described as a mixture of a TV show slash movie slash novel with how much story there is. Add in the gameplay that is really bloody fun, and you had something that was better than all three types of media put together. In 2007, it was an emergent form of media that sadly fell a favor around 2014 for loot boxes and games as a service. But in 07, this game showed that just because something was a video game didn't mean it was just bleeps and bloops and violence. You can be male or female. Mm, so much for no females in games, eh? And 2007 was not the first time you got to select a female character in an RPG, as Knights of the Old Republic, both 1 and 2, allowed you to choose your gender. The character creator for Mass Effect was impressive both then and now. Back in 07, we had never before had this kind of graphically advanced face sculpture, and today it still looks pretty good, as it's not too photorealistic. There is a law of diminishing returns when it comes to photorealism. If you go too realistic, then you start to dip into Uncanny Valley, as it's more obvious how it's a 3D model, whereas a less graphically complex model allows one's mind to fill in the gaps. In any event, after you spend an hour making your character, it's time to choose a first name. Unlike in other RPGs, you have a set last name. Shepard. This allows for greater immersion as characters will actually call you by your name. It's a little weird though when your space girlfriend calls you by your last name, but then there's only so much the developers can do. In Mass Effect, you play as Commander Shepard, a male or female Alliance Naval Officer Marine Navy SEAL aka N7 guy or girl. In addition to your face and class, you get to choose your origin and backstory, and this will have an impact on the story somewhat. The various characters will comment on your backstory and origin origin, and one or two quests will mention it. There are three origins to choose from, Earthborn, Colonist, and Spaceborn. As a filthy Earther, I mean a wonderful person, you grew up on the streets fighting to survive. As a Colonist, you grew up in the boonies of space fighting to survive. And as a Spaceborn, you were like Geordi LaForge from Star Trek. You grew up in space and have space in your blood. For the backstory, you have Soul Survivor, Ruthless, and War Hero. Soul Survivor is what it sounds like. Ruthless means you do what it takes to get things done. And War Hero has it where you single-handedly held off Batarian slavers during an attack 
attack on a colony. I always choose the squeakiest clean backstory of Spaceborn slash War Hero as it is the one that appeals the most to me. As you would expect, my shepherd is going to be the nicest nice guy who ever nice it up. Hell, the Adam West Batman might tell me to tone it down a bit. So we're going to be seeing a full Paragon playthrough with my shepherd being a magical nerd. The game proper begins with a splash of text that gives you just enough information to know how the universe began and what you're going to find within it. Mass Effect draws a lot of inspiration from past science fiction franchises, such as Trek slash Wars and the criminally underrated show Babylon. 5. And keep in mind that back in 2007, it was the only game and bit of media in the Mass Effect franchise, and yet the backstory is fully formed and extensive. The story for the game was written by KOTOR veteran Drew Karpishan, and he delivers on a story that is every bit as extensive as Star Wars itself, except that Star Wars uh, had three movies and a crap ton of novels, whereas Mass Effect had in 2007 one bloody game and has pretty much the same amount of backstory which is nothing short of insane. In the game itself much of the story and backstory is fleshed out in character interactions but to give even greater context and explanations as to how everything works the Masters of Bioware gave the player a codex. This has both primary and secondary listings. The primary is voice acted and gives basic information and the secondary gives more info and isn't voice acted. So yeah you get a game and pretty much an essential guide too. What this allows for is a much more real and greater realized world. When you don the N7 armor of Great Justice, you're not just playing a game, you're entering a fully realized and created virtual world, and it's thanks to the Codex and Drew Karpishan's attention to detail that we have a world that has the endurance and wonder of Star Wars slash Trek. So what's the bloody story then if it's so great? In the year 2148, scientists on Mars uncovered a cache of alien artifacts. This allowed for the development of faster-than-light travel using a means of controlling space and time. The species of the galaxy call it the Mass Effect. The game takes place in 2183 and stars you, Commander Shepard. You take control of Shepard after going through the Mass Relay, the big giant awesome machine, and it's a device that allows ships to travel the galaxy faster than conventional FTL. Conventional FTL is limited by a need to discharge built up static electricity and is very slow compared to Mass Relay travel. We first get introduced to two major characters, Joker, played by Seth Green, and Kaden Alinko, played by Karth, I can't trust anybody, you Nazi himself, Raphael Subbarge, and yes, I know he played Blow em All Up Scorch from Republic Commando 2. Our first conversation will set the tone of the game. A character named Nihilus compliments Joker on his piloting and then leaves. Joker says he hates that guy, and we get some light, non-cringe banter, and you potentially can join in if you're nice Shep, or you can tell him to shut up if you're dick Shep. Then, Captain Anderson, played by Keith David, orders Shep to come to the comm room, and Joker, as will become common, makes an ass of himself, much to Caden's amusement. That smirk on Caden Alinko's face blew everyone's mind back in 2007. That kind of facial animation was unheard of back then, and it's still damn impressive today. And this is as good a time as any to talk about Joker, aka Jeff Moreau. Joker is voiced by Seth Green, the last voice actor I would ever think to see in a sci-fi adventure like Mass Effect, but he does an amazing job as Joker and becomes one of the pillars of Mass Effect. Jeff Moreau is the pilot of the Normandy and he will be the pilot for the entire trilogy. He is a Joker and he will constantly make snide remarks and be very snarky and will generally try to uh, bring some levity to the game. Whether or not you love him or hate him really comes down to your personality. He does have the appropriately tragic backstory. He was born with brittle bone disease and thus he thought he couldn't blah 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 he becomes a super space pilot. Upon arriving in the briefing room you meet the Turian Spectre known as Nihilus. A Turian is kind of a Sangheli looking species of alien that fought a brief war with humanity and thus is viewed with some suspicion by the more species humans. You learn that you are heading to a tutorial, I mean um, Eden Prime to pick up a Prothean 
Prothean Beacon. The Protheans are a race of precursor aliens, not unlike the Forerunners from Halo. They were powerful tens of thousands of years ago, but disappeared. It is believed that they created the mass relays and they were the species behind the technology the humans and by extension the rest of the galaxy found to get FTL. You also learn that you are being evaluated for membership in the Not Jedi called the Spectres. Agents, more or less like James Bond, that travel the galaxy fighting criminals that regular cops cannot handle. During the briefing, you get a message from Eden Prime. It's under attack. Convenient. And we get introduced to Sover, I mean an alien ship, that will come to be your nemesis. It attacks Eden Prime and you vow to defeat your foe. What's cool about this prologue is it's fast efficient and gets the player up to speed with a minimum of info dumps and if you're a mass effect veteran you can play a smart ship and have him already know everything so it's time to head down to the planet nihilus goes on ahead because he works alone and you kaden and redshirt head off on your own to get to the beacon instant redshirt lives up to his name and dies to the first and easiest enemy in the game you vow to have his body buried after the battle and move on First level is visually impressive with wide open areas and excellent background details. You immediately find Gunnery Chief Dick, I mean aka Ashley Williams. Her squad got wiped out and against Shepard's better judgment she is allowed to join the team. Kaden Alenko is a 100% cool dude as you will find out throughout the game. He had a rough childhood but got over it. He's a little reserved but he has a dry wit and will generally try to do the right thing. He is a biotic which we'll cover a bit later and since he's a biotic he is sometimes viewed with a little bit of suspicion by his other crewmates. Ashley Williams is a bigoted, hot-headed douche that in later games treats Shepard, male or female, like trash. She treats everyone else like crap and loves interrupting with snide remarks. She has a big family and has a chip on her shoulder a mile wide because her grandfather had to surrender during the first contact war with the Turians. She also hates Turians due to this. She blames her lack of promotion through the ranks on her grandfather having to surrender and not her abrasive and hot-headed actions. You could say that she has a reason to have a chip on her shoulder a mile wide and she has an excuse for why she treats everyone like crap However, it's one of those interesting chicken slash egg sorts of things. Could she have been nicer had she not had the albatross of past actions hanging over her head? Or was she always a bit of a dick? It's up to the player to determine which one is accurate. So anyway, you kill some enemy called the Geth. They are a race of machines created by the Quarians. The Geth killed 99% of the Quarians during their AI uprising. And normally, the Geth never leave the former Quarian homeworlds. After blasting some bots, you meet some Humies. This scientist basically spoils the entire plot for the trilogy, but Shepard cannot put two and two together. As Nice Shep, you tell him to get some rest. As Insane Shep, you deck him for some reason. In a cutscene, you get some great audio-visual shorthand that introduces our main villain for the game, Saren. He lulls Nihilus into a false sense of security and then blasts him in the back of the head. Saren is behind the attack on Eden Prime. In short, he hates humanity and even caused Captain Anderson some trouble back in the day. In order to mess with Shepard, he leaves some bombs for you to disarm. After stopping the mad bummer, you find the Prothean Beacon that caused all the problems and Ash, being her usual dumbass self, almost gets Shep killed by stupidly going up to the beacon and setting it off. Shepard pushes her out of the way and gets a brain full of... Uh, nine inch nails? This was a legitimately scary scene back in 2007. It's like something out of 40k, man. And if you know, you know. Shep wakes back up on the Normandy and is told that he had his brain scrambled. The resident doctor for the Normandy is Doc Chakwas, a cool side character that sticks with Shep throughout the entire franchise and will always have something uplifting to say and is one of the core side characters of the franchise. The cutscene leading up to the Citadel shows off what the Xbox 360 could do and still looks pretty good today and we get to ooh and ah with the characters as they see it for the first time. The Citadel and by extension the Citadel Council are inspired by the 
TV show Babylon 5. In that show, there were numerous species and they all came together on the space station Babylon 5 to try and keep the peace. In that show, humanity built and ran that station. In Mass Effect, everyone thinks that the station was built by the Protheans and run by a council of alien species and humanity is not quite powerful enough to have a seat on that council. You have the blue alien space babes called the Asari. Like the Mimbari in Babylon 5, they are the most ancient and powerful species in council space and are first among equals. Then you have the Turians. They have the largest fleet and fought a war with humanity and their species is based around military service, but they are soldiers, not warriors. Then you've got the Salarians. They are the scientists and spies of the Citadel. The Citadel is a dangerous place. It's a port of call, a home away from home. It has hustlers, thieves, cutthroats, but it's our last best hope for peace. Your trip to the Citadel is to meet up with the Citadel Council, as you have to provide answers for, well, the Prothean beacon being exploded, a Turian Spectre being shotted, and also the Gather invading, and that might be your fault too. You get grilled, and you get a lot of dialogue options for how you want to present yourself, but most of them will be a bit forceful. The council is portrayed fairly. They are not just obstructive bureaucrats with little knowledge of how things really work. Instead, they raise legitimate objections, and will listen to Shepard if Shepard has legitimate data to back up his claims. Sadly, you don't really have legitimate data to back up your claims that Saren was Batman, or Turian. Not helping matters is Ambassador Udina. So yeah, he shows up, yells at the council, yells at you, and he does this for most of the series. However, it is implied that off screen he does a pretty good job, even though when he's on screen you want to call him a bastard and then walk away. Since there's no real evidence that Saren, the council's best agent, is a bad Turian, the council blows you off. After this, you get to explore the Citadel. It is huge with a lot of areas to explore, and this is where the frame rate tanks. Still though, it runs pretty good on an Xbox 360, especially when you consider how detailed these environments are. The Citadel theme is also quite beautiful and doesn't get annoying. On the Citadel, you can meet a lot of characters and finish a bunch of side quests, but the important bits are as follows. You get three of your party members on the Citadel, Garrus Vicarian fan favorite and all around badass, and he is most assuredly impressed by your prowess and take charge attitude. Garrus Vicarian is an interesting character in that he is a stereotypical hero dude, but he's a dark hero dude with a lot of, shall we say, violent tendencies that you can either exacerbate or moderate. Erdnot Rex is my favorite character in the entire bloody franchise. He looks cool, he sounds cool, he talks cool, and has a great backstory and motivation. Rex is from the species known as the Krogan. They are a warlike species from the planet Tachanka. They nuked themselves into barbarism, but were later uplifted by the council to fight another alien species called the Rachni. After the Rachni War, the Krogan turned on the galaxy and were only brought to heal after they were infected with a disease called the Genophage. The Genophage ensures that there are a few Krogan live births. The Krogan are a scattered people and Rex when you meet him is just a two-bit merc despite being a ancient and wise Krogan battle master. He will get less acerbaic and less despondent as the game goes on if you are a good Shep. He is a very complex character and is very complex even when compared to the other very well-written party members. He looks like he should just be an asshole but he has so many hidden depths, and by the end of the franchise, he's like a whole new man, or Krogan. The last character you meet is my second favorite character in the entire franchise. You know her, you love her, it's Tally Zora Vos Normandy, I mean, um, Naraya. You meet her when you hear that a Quarian, no name given yet, has data pertaining to Saren, and you gotta save her before Saren's assassins can take her down. This is a fun mission because you have a time limit. You evaporate some Serenites and save the purple beauty. In this game, Tally Zora is a cute space nerd girl of great justice, but you can't romancer. She is on her pilgrimage for her people and joins up with you for fun and to take down Saren. The Quarians are a scattered people, not unlike the Krogan. However, they scatter themselves due to dabbling in AI. AI in the Mass Effect universe is a big no-no because as far as the council knows, and they happen to be right about this, AI will turn upon their creators, just as the Geth did. 
Now, the Geth will be fleshed out in later games, as will the Quarians, but having this prohibition against AI is not necessarily a bad idea. The Quarians, due to being a fleet-based people, because for whatever reason they can't seem to get a colony world, are stuck inside their suits, which look a lot like Geth, and inside these suits they have to live because they have no immune system. The Quarians will come to be a very cool faction in later games. One of the more interesting missions on the Citadel is a side quest that brings you to a woman known as the Consort. She gives you some cryptic crap. Or is it cryptic? Ah, uh, if you know, you know. I love how Mass Effect has enough continuity that easily missed side quests can properly foreshadow things to come. The prologues in Mass Effect 1 do not overstay their welcome, and everything in them has a purpose. Contrast this to Bioware's Knights of the Old Republic 1. I loved that game, and still do, but that game has two really bloody long and dare I say really bloody boring prologues. In that game, you start out on a ship called the Indar Spire. It's very exciting. Then you crash land on a planet called Terrace, and it takes forever. Ever. And then when you finally leave Terrace, you head to Dantooine so you can learn at the Jedi Academy. And that takes forever. After about five bloody hours, you finally get into space. Here, everything works in service to the plot and sets the game up quick so you can get to the good stuff. After rescuing Tally, you get summoned by the Council. The data that Tally had mentioned something called the Reapers. And when you get brought in front of the Council, you tell them about it. Uh, however, you don't really have any more information other than the name and that you had a dream about him. Even though Shep admits to having the scary dream, the Council still makes him a specter and the music swells and Shep takes his first steps into a larger world. And thus, the prologue finally ends. In addition to becoming a free agent for a Galactic Council, he is also given command of the Normandy, but for whatever reason, he does not get increased in rank. You know, come to think of it, the whole rank structure is a bit weird. The game never gives us an adequate explanation for why it's Commander, not Captain Shepard. And speaking of captains, not all ends well as Captain Anderson is forced to retire. He is an excellent character, and he will be with us for the entire franchise, and serves as a great mentor for Shepard. He kind of was Shep in the novel Mass Effect Revelation. He, in that novel, was a kick-ass officer, got the job done, and was even a good guy like Paragon Shepard. The novel fills in even more details about the universe, and introduces a character that will cameo in Mass Effect 3. In Mass Effect Revelations, we learn that Saren and Anderson had a bit of a, uh, issue with one another, and Saren did Anderson dirty in that novel, and framed Anderson for a major screw-up, and cost Anderson his chance at being a Spectre. When you arrive on the Normandy, you get a chance to give a speech, and the best part is you get a lot of dialogue choices. When Mass Effect came out, I was afraid that dialogue for the main character would be kept to a minimum due to the fact that it was voiced. Remember, in 2007, the idea of talking in games was not that old at that time, and the idea of a talking protagonist in an RPG was beyond cutting edge. And when you compare this game to later talking RPGs, you get dialogue that is nothing more than the fever dream of a madman. You control how you want Shepard to be, and you are never railroaded to say something. Each dialogue option is not just another variation of yes. And your speeches really show this. You can vary up what you say, and it's not all good and not all bad. After giving your Picard speech, you walk up to the galaxy map and get ready to step out into the galaxy and make history. You can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. The game does give you three plot relevant missions, but you are under no time constraints to do them. You can cruise to various planets and each planet will have a little flavor text, with one planet even having a reference to both Doom and the groundbreaking science fiction film Forbidden Planet. The flavor text mentions monsters from the id. Unlike in later games, you don't have to worry about fuel or probes or... <sighs> scanning for iridium. You just explore strange new worlds and mark them later for mining, and you even get a little XP boost for that. There are a limited number of planet biomes, but they are all well detailed and look amazing. Mass Effect truly is the best Star Trek game ever made, because you do get to feel like a Starfleet captain, more Kirk than Picard. Yeah, you can be more diplomatic like Picard in some areas, but this is more of a rough and tumble galaxy than the 24th century. Like in Trek, you get a bunch of missions to investigate distress beacons, 
Champions, and you will periodically be given missions by Admiral Hackett, voiced by Lance Hendrickson. These are optional, but I always do them because Lance is the man. The feeling of vastness and intimacy pervades Mass Effect 1. You feel like you are on the front lines of exploration while also being part of the larger galaxy. Sadly, none of the later games, for me at least, would feel this good. So now, let's take a look at those three plot relevant missions. You got Novaria, Pharos, and the most important one of all, rescuing your blue beauty from the Geth. Yes, the first mission I recommend doing is rescuing Liara to Sony. The plot relevant missions will be higher detailed and will have large game spaces compared to the side quests. And instead of just landing on a planet and walking six feet to the mission area, you have to drive the Mako to the mission area. And I gotta tell you, wonky controls aside, these driving segments are really bloody fun and make these planets feel really big and not just five feet of game zone. You will be fighting a good number of enemies as you play through the game. Some will be organic, your generic pirates and mercs, and others will be the Geth. The Geth are the generic bad guy of the game. In this game, they're primarily just basic robotic enemies with little characterization and feel a lot like the Terminators. And so pretty much what you do in this game when it comes to the Geth is you use your superior tech to blast them back to the stone or vacuum tube, I guess, age? You have to fight through some epic areas to get to some Prothean ruins to rescue Liara. And when you do get to her, you find her all tied up in a Prothean security field. Oh my. Shepard rescues her by rearranging some architecture. Yeah, I'm sure Caden felt a little something sent through the forest by his alter ego. You meet Liara and it's love at first sight. Liara, or Liera as uh, Commander Shepard voiced by Mark Muir pronounces the name in this game, is an Asari and they are a naturally biotic species. Biotics are this game's force powers and are based on science instead of magic. The way the Mass Effect field works is you got this thing called Element Zero, or Ezo as it's called. It lies at the heart of the FTL drive and biotics. It is an element that when exposed to an electrical current will warp mass. A positive charge increases mass and a negative charge decreases it. Pretty much all high tech will use this mass effect field. Biotics have nodules in their bodies that occur when a fetus is exposed to concentrations of element zero. Using these nodules and an implant, various species can form personal element zero fields to pull off various powers such as slamming bastards into walls or sucking them up into a black hole. Liara to Sony is a natural biotic and is thus able to stomp more or less everything. The reason you rescue Liara is that in addition to being a good guy, Saren is looking for something called the Conduit and she just might know where it is. When you rescue her, if you have ass Lee in your party, she is of course a dick to her. You have to escape the ruins before they collapse. Mass Effect 1 might have been a little bit stiff in the third person shooter department compared to later games, but it got its fights right. The boss battle has you facing a Krogan and some Geth. You can potentially die a lot, especially if you're a squishy guy like my Commander Shepard, especially if that Krogan bastard gets into melee. After you evaporate the Krogan, you escape the tunnels in an awesome scene and complete the dream team. After the various plot relevant missions, you get a Star Trek staple, the meeting room, where you and the crew will discuss amongst yourselves what to do next. This makes you, the player, feel like you are living a Star Trek or general sci-fi TV show, and this makes the game feel that much more real. Alas, this would be dropped in later games, much to the rest of the franchise's detriment. Here, Liara talks about how the Protheans disappeared and how the galaxy is built upon a cycle of extinction and how each civilization builds upon the one that came before it. Shep tells Liara about the Reapers. He believes that they exist, but Liara is skeptical. Astley, as is her habit, interrupts Liara's attempt to do something constructive, like, I don't know, figure out how the Reapers factor into the galactic extinction. You end the meeting and send Astley to peel space potatoes. I wish. You then get another cool element that's only found in this game. You are a council specter and thus you are expected to report to the council. You can decline them, but my Shep is a true blue good guy and thus chats with them. They say much what you would expect. They chastise you when you blow something up, but will be supportive when it's called for. People hate them, but I can see their point. They are not on the ground and thus you have to inform them of what's going on. It's one element that makes the game feel even more real. Speaking of real, when you are on the Normandy, you are in your light duty BDUs 
instead of your combat armor. Back in the old KOTOR days, you and your party just wandered around in your armor with weapons in your hands. Here, you dress like what you would expect, and Mass Effect 1 has the best light duty BDU by far, nothing too ostentatious while still having some style. The Normandy itself is nothing short of amazing in terms of design. The ship is huge on the inside, with many cabins and fluff locations. It feels like a real capital ship. The ship itself is a big a part of the game as the bloody combat. This is where Mass Effect goes from a great game to a transcendent one. The sheer amount of immersion is simply second to none. You feel like Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect TV show. The Normandy SR-1 is a ship design on par with Andrew Probert's Constitution Class Enterprise. It is instantly memorable and recognizable, and is unique in the fleet yard of famous starships. It is a long, thin ship with overtones of a nuke boat. The difference between the SSV Normandy and the USS Enterprise is that you are Captain Kirk. You make its history, you go on the voyages, and you choose what kind of captain you want to be. Mass Effect was truly revolutionary as it showed that video games could be the next generation of entertainment. All right, all right, we get it. The ship is beautiful. Can we please get back to the story already? Saren has teamed up with Liara's mom, aka Counselor Troy, aka Matriarch Benezia. Since Asari are long lived, they have two phases to their lives. They've got the maiden phase, aka childhood slash early adulthood, that's Liara, and the matron phase, middle age slash old age, that is Benezia. The matron phase is where the Asari is super old, super wise and super powerful. No one knows why a super wise, super old, super powerful matriarch would work for Saren, but here we are. We got a galaxy to search, so let's go do it. Or do a shit ton of side quests instead. There is a quest to find Prothean data disks. Oh yeah, since this is 07, we still are rocking optical media discs, which is not a bad idea since physical media is a better way to securely store media than the cloud. Anyway, after you find all the discs, you find a device to play the discs, and you learn via hologram that the Protheans were watching Earth for some unknown reason. This is an unintentional callback to Star Trek, as this cool concept is never seen or heard from again. You can go back to the Citadel, and on there, you can meet a guy named Conrad Werner. He is Shepard's biggest fan, and will later cosplay as him. Your Shepard can either find him annoying, or will accept his fandom. Conrad Werner is not nearly as annoying as that dark elf in Oblivion, and there's nothing wrong with a little hero worship, and you can indulge him a bit by posing for a selfie. I rather like the idea that my Shepard is a good guy with a goofy streak. Yeah, a ruthless bastard may get the job done, but really, a ruthless asshole would more likely lie about his progress and seek to enrich himself instead of saving the galaxy. A ruthless Shepard is a renegade, after all, and renegades seldom are known for following orders. And speaking of a chance to be a paragon or renegade, the reporter ladies and gentlemen. This character is a test for the player. There is a CNN reporter that appears in all three games, and she will be a bitch to Shepard and say how bad he is, and a psycho dick can punch her in the face. Or a good Shepard can talk to her like a normal person. As my Shepard is a goofy professional kind of guy and an all-around world-class bullshitter, he plays her like a space cello. Really, would you want a guy who goes around punching innocent people in the face as your galactic savior? Depending on when you go back to the Citadel, you might meet up with Admiral Malkovich, an individual that wants to investigate a top secret starship, despite the fact that he's not in your chain of command. So therefore it's treason then. This is a cool segment because he actually has different responses depending on your Paragon or Renegade rating. Mine wasn't all that high at this point in the game, so he doesn't agree with all the Xenos on board, but he does admit that I probably know what I'm doing, and that is high praise indeed, and an epic victory that turns an enemy into a potential ally. Let's head to Pharos! Pharos is a colony world that has reported some Geth sightings. You arrive and sight the Geth with your pistol and blast them into scrap. The colony of Zeus Hope is in a bad way, attacked by Geth and is in a shambles, and thus it's up to Captain Kirk, aka Commander Shepard, to fix it. And yes, you can legitimately fix up the colony, and as you fix up the colony, you find some hints that all is not right. So now you gotta follow the Geth to the Exogeny headquarters. They are Wayland Yutani wannabes, and they set up the colony 
colony. And this is where the Mako comes in handy because you have an epic battle across the awesome skyway. Eventually you come across some corporate shills. The leader attempts to act all intimidating even though he's about five foot one and has the build of a stick. You put him in his place and you head on to the main corporate facility. You have some epic battles and finally learn the colony's deep dark secret. Saren attacks Zeus Hope to get access to a plant monster called the Thorian. This is something straight out of pure Star Trek. You start out with what looks like a regular mission, and instead you gotta deal with an outside context problem. The Thorian has mind control abilities and has seized control of the colony and has cut you off from your ship. You also stop back by the corporate shills and Vili Von Badass tries to say that he's going to kill all the civilians. If you have a high enough Paragon rating, you can talk him down. If you don't, like I do in this playthrough, you shoot him in the face and his guards back down. Down. Good move. Mass Effect gives us some varied gameplay and moral choices yet again. You need to get through Zeus Hope to get to the Thorian. You can do this either by being a psycho and killing everyone, or by being a sane person and using a knockout gas grenade given to you by the scientists to knock all the colonists out, thus saving the colony and getting you to the Thorian with no more difficulty. Now, the Thorian is a really cool design that looks like that plant thing from Super Metroid. It uses a mind control to sorry to talk and gives you some cryptic crap or potentially foreshadowing. This is a bloody tough fight, so be sure to save during the lulls in combat. You are attacked by Thorian Creepers. They hurt and will poison you, and if you don't save often, you go all the way back to the start. Your objective is to shoot the Thorian's brain tentacles. Do that and you kill it. And you save another sexy Asari. She tells you about indoctrination and Sovereign. Sovereign is a Reaper, one of the larger Dreadnought class ones. And indoctrination is the Reaper's mind control tech. Reapers use this to control organics. And so if you put two and two together, you learn that Sovereign is actually the real villain and is just using Saren and Benezia as puppets. You also also get what is called the cipher so that you can decipher the information you got from the Prothean beacon. You can either kill or let the sexy lady go. As Hero Shep, I let her go. And thus the mission comes to a close. During the debriefing, Liara uses a sorry telepathy, Spock style, to make use of the cipher in Shepard's brain. And this allows her to make sense of the Prothean beacon's message and learns that yes, the Reapers did indeed wipe out the Protheans and this shit just got real. Our second plot relevant mission is on Novaria. It's got more corpo bullshit for you to deal with. You get met at the landing platform by some Renicops and Spectre outranks a $10 corporate merc any day. You have a mission now to try and get to a lab facility that has been leased by Saren. Shepard is a badass. He should, with the Normandy at his side, be able to take down anyone or anything. And if you're ruthless or a renegade, you shouldn't have to do the quest that the game makes you do. You have to go through the labyrinthine politics of Novaria to get a garage pass. Okay, if you're some no-name Jedi, I get it, but Commander Bloody Shepard ain't got time for that. Whatever, you do a quest to get some incriminating data on the corporate leader, give it to an internal affairs officer, and finally get the show back on the bloody road. You get an epic driving segment where you drive through the icy wastelands of Novaria, fighting the foul forces of the Geth, and you better believe they're not just enemies that spawn to attack you. The game goes out of its way to tell you that Matriarch Benezia went through the port with a bunch of boxes. Boxes filled with geth bastards. And you blast those bastards and make it to a derelict science facility. Oh yes, it's time for that aliens homage. The facility is quite, too quite, quite filled with xenomorph, I mean, um, rachni, yeah, the, the, the rachni. The rachni are a super cool space bug and they hurt. But by this point, I've leveled up enough that I slaughter just about everything. So we mulch us some space bugs. The best part about early Novaria is that you come to a puzzle. You gotta get the reactor running so you can progress through the level. This puzzle can be annoying, but if you have enough Omni Gel, you can just bypass the bloody thing. Hey, my Shep may be a nerd, but while he still has proper grooming standards, he is definitely, like any proper nerd, a lazy bastard, and wants to get on with the plot. 
you bring the station back online and head to the Delta Labs, or I mean, uh, the Hot Labs. You learn that Dr. Betruger, or, um, idiot scientists, were resurrecting a species of Xeno called the Rachni. They were an intelligent and spacefaring race of scary bugs that brought the galaxy to its knees 1,000 years before the game. Only the Krogan were able to stop them. Eventually, you fight your way to the boss of the level, Matriarch Benezia. She gives you the wahaha speech, and Shepard tries to get her to accept him because he wants to have sex. I mean, um, court her daughter. She rejects Shepard as a human reprobate punk with bad hair, and you do battle with her. The boss fight here is tough. Benezia is supposed to be a bad underscore ass, and the game talks up about how tough a 1,000-year-old blue milf is supposed to be, and the game delivers. She will kill you a lot, and your squad will go down a lot, and not in the good way either. Yeah, all the little bastards might fall before your might, but uh, she ain't going down that easy. After you tell her that you would be a perfect match for her daughter, she breaks free of Sovereign's conditioning, and she tells you that she was sent to get the location of the Mew Relay from the Rachni, and that Saren is definitely being controlled by Sovereign. She also tells her daughter goodbye in a really touching and sad scene. This was gaming in the future, and sadly no other Mass Effect game would be this good. Yeah, Mass Effect can have some ropey dialogue here and there, but the VA work for the mains really shines in scenes like this. So Benezia dies, and then you are immediately introduced to the Rachni Queen. She is intelligent and talks through a dead Asari body. Kind of like the Thorian. The Queen explains that she was forced against her will to create the Rachni drones you have been killing, and that she is actually peaceful and just wants a chance to survive. This is a legitimate moral conundrum that is right out of Babylon 5 and Star Trek. Do you trust the evil looking alien? Could she be lying? And do you have the right to commit genocide? Can you risk letting the Queen live? This was and is a deep question. Do you, in the interest of keeping your species safe, exterminate other alien life 40k style? just in case that they might be evil and potentially be a threat down the road. My Shepard is a good guy. He does not commit genocide, and the Queen is set free. The Rachni and your decision to either spare or destroy her is very similar to an episode of Star Trek The Original Series called The Devil in the Dark. In that episode, Captain Kirk has to investigate some miners that were going missing. Essentially, they were being killed by an evil-looking alien called a Horta. Before Kirk can destroy the evil Horta, Spock is able to learn that the Horta is not evil at all, and instead was simply defending itself from the miners as the miners had mistakenly destroyed some of its eggs. Turning the bug-eyed alien concept on its head is nothing new, but Mass Effect does it well. And remember, you're the one making that choice, thus making it even more satisfying. During the post-mission debriefing, you debate about your next move. You know where the Mew Relay is, but it doesn't help you all that much because it can link to a bunch of unrelated systems. Astley acts like a bitch to the woman who just lost her mother. But sadly, you don't get to boot her to the brig, but you do dress her down and then calm the rest of the crew. The council chews you out for not killing the queen, and I can't blame them, but whatever. So around this time is when the romance really kicks in. After having played countless hours of Mass Effect and having dated Tally, Asley, and trying to date the MILF mama herself, Samara, in Mass Effect 2, I have found that the Liara Shep ship is by far the most satisfying relationship, and we will be continuing it through to the other games in the trilogy. The best part about the Liara Shep ship is that it feels natural and it grows over the game and by extension the rest of the trilogy. Liara herself grows throughout the series and despite all the trials and tribulations, never betrays Shepard and will always stand by him no matter what. Here, she is every bit the nerd girl that Tally is, if a bit more restrained. This budding romance is treated quite realistically. Shepard and Liara at first glance appear to have very little in common. But you do have a mutual attraction to one another despite this, and as you play throughout the game, Shepard and Liara end up finding out that they are not quite as different as they first thought. When people talk about Star Trek the original series, they like to say that Kirk was a ladies man. Well, if you watch the show, he doesn't actually do that. He usually just falls in love with a woman, and through one contrivance or another, he has to leave said woman behind. It is said multiple times, and even by him, that he doesn't need a woman, he's got the Enterprise. It was only after the show got picked up by meme culture that it was said that Kirk got busy with alien titties. And it was only after meme culture got a hold to Maserect that people said it was blue titties all the way down. 
Liara is a complicated character. She starts out as a blue Indiana Jones. She kicks ass, takes names, all in the name of expanding knowledge of the Protheans, aka complete nerd. Shepard doesn't seduce her. In fact, she is a harder girl to get together with than, say, Ashley. She starts out completely unfamiliar with humans and is a bit hesitant to even be around them. It's only over the course of the game that she warms up to you and at the very end you get together. Upon completing two of the three plot relevant missions, you get a message about a Solarian STG team, aka amphibian space seals, that are in a spot of bother on a planet called Vermeer. Vermeer is the midpoint of the game and will be the landmark mission of this game and the franchise as a whole. And it's not hard to see why. We start with the drop and you get stuck in blasting bastards while trying to dodge these crab aliens cause well, Shepard, he good guy and thus does not want to harm wildlife unless he has to. This opener is action packed as you'd want it with some great graphics such as the waves hitting the rocks. You take down some AA guns and the Normandy lands and the franchise already riding high gets even higher. So you meet up with Captain We Will Hold the Line, Kirahi, and he informs you that Saren is able to breed Krogan, thus curing the genophage. But you gotta blow the science facility cause Saren Badman. Rex is understandably distraught about this and thus this is where you can lose him. Bioware games did have character death prior to Mass Effect, but they were telegraphed and you had a lot of chances to stop them. In KOTOR you could, and I did, kill a potential party member named Juhani, but she appeared at first to just be a standard bad guy. Later in the game you could kill a few other characters if you so chose, but in order to do that you had to be a Jonas Venture level douche. But here in Mass Effect, you could just be going about your merry way blasting bad guys and righting wrongs and uh, why is Rex pointing a shot? at my head. In 07, I had no problem in talking Rex down. However, during a previous attempt at reviewing this game, I rushed way more than I did in this playthrough. And well, if your Paragon score is too low, you can't say what you need to stop Rex, and the coolest character in all of Mass Effect can die right here. For me, it's all the more hardcore because the game never lets you get prepared for it. There are no loyalty missions in this game. Yeah, you can do some personal missions for characters, but it doesn't really mean as much as it does in Mass Effect 2. For Rex, you can get his grandfather's armor, but it doesn't mean much, because if you don't have that Paragon level up, he will die right here. You have to convince Rex that you've got to destroy the science facility so that the Krogan can be free instead of slaves. And if your Paragon level is high enough, he will back down. If it's not, Astley will shoot him. So after you ensure that Astley can't be a bigger ass than she normally is, you and Kirahi hatch a plan to take down Saren's obedience domes. You'll be going right up the middle and Kirahi and his second stringers will provide a distraction. You will then use Captain Kirahi's ship's engine as an atomic bomb and blow the facility to hell. It gets complicated when you have to choose a party member to act as a liaison. I chose Kaden cause he is not a bride of the emperor and blowhard like Astley and actually uses his brain. Once you choose the liaison, Kirihi will give a really stirring speech and makes the game yet again feel much more alive than later entries. Because this speech is not given by you. You are a character inside of the world of Mass Effect and thus it doesn't revolve entirely around you. We will hold the line indeed. This speech and that phrase will persist throughout the rest of the trilogy. You set out for great justice. As you fight your way to the base, you'll be given some optional objectives to help your bros out. Once you finally reach the base proper, the fights are good, but sadly there is a missed opportunity that I swear had to be cut for time. You find a Krogan named Dr. Droyus. He tells you that he is trying to save his species. However, you can't talk to him as he just attacks you, and this seems like it should be important, but you have no choice but to shoot him, and for such an important character, he is just there like any random foot soldier. In fact, you might even miss him cause you kill him so fast. A similar character to Dr. Droyus will appear in Mass Effect 2 and possibly was meant to even be him. And speaking of things going nowhere, you encounter a potentially recurring character, Ranathanoptis. She snivels at you and begs you not to blast her. And you get a bit of a conundrum. Should you shoot her or not? You don't really know what she did or didn't do. And well, my shepherd is committed to peace and justice. So Shep lets her live and she will appear in later games, but never accomplishes much, making me wonder what the point of her was. You find a random control panel, or so you think. Rex says he's got a 20% different bad feeling about this and the franchise gets even higher. The music 
the voice acting and design all come together to create a feeling of dread. The masters of Bioware knew that this big reveal had to be done with restraint. They hit little hints. They teased the power of Sovereign. All throughout the game, you heard that the Reapers killed all the Protheans, you heard about indoctrination, and now you are talking to the big bastard himself. The Reapers are inspired by the Babylon 5 villain known as the Shadows. The Reapers of Mass Effect share some of the Shadows design and have a vaguely similar motivation. In Babylon 5, the Shadows wanted to control evolution and make what they called the younger races stronger by forcing them to fight one another. The Shadows would also call races now and again for their own purposes. The Reapers do much the same. They created the Master Relays and built the Citadel and ensured that the races of the galaxy follow their technological designs. And thus, when the time is right, they return and reap the entire galaxy. It has happened countless times before, and this time should be no different. It's scary in this game because we have no idea why they do this. Sadly, in later games, we will get two explanations, each dumber than the last. For now, though, the masters of Bioware outdid themselves. You got a game and a universe that rivals the great science fiction franchises, but then they kicked it up a notch by introducing an evil Cthulhu space robot. So after Sovereign gives his big ol' wah-ha-ha -ha speech, Shep tells him to shove a USB stick up his A drive. Sovereign gets mad and blows the windows up and charges toward Shep. You gotta deploy the bomb and get the hell out. So you have Caden off on one part of the base and Astley at another guarding your makeshift bomb. In none of the later games are you forced to make a choice such as this. No matter how good or how bad you play the game, someone gonna die. I agonized over this choice for like 30 minutes back in 07, even laying back on my bed to weigh the pros and cons. Caden is a cool guy who overcomes his childhood trauma and isn't afraid of anything and is voiced by bloody Karth Onasi. Ashley has a big ass, and as an 18 year old when this game came out, it wasn't that hard of a choice to choose that over Caden's epicness. As a much wiser 33 year old, I still went with Ashley, eh, despite my major disdain for her. She is guarding the bomb and you need to make sure the base gets exploded, it. and so the great gaming bro of Caden Alinko is left to die while we go and save the harpy that is Ashley. You get a boss battle with Saren, and he's on a little M. Bison floaty platform. Shep tries his world-class bullshitter act on Saren, and almost reaches the bitter old bastard underneath the indoctrination and robot parts. Alas though, you just can't quite convince him to give up the whole genocide thing. The fight is impressive, and Saren can be a little tough, but it's nothing a few powers can't stop. Saren is recalled by Sovereign, and while I would taunt him by saying he's running away like a little bitch, you can see Saren is trying to fight the indoctrination, but just can't quite do it. So since he at least tries to fight his indoctrination, he gets a tiny shred of respect in my book. After he runs, you pick up Ashley and fly off into gaming history. No mission before or since was this bloody fun, and no mission before or after this one would be this much of an emotional bloody roller coaster. And then you still, in addition to all this greatness, have that bloody briefing afterwards. And here, Ashley just can't let it drop, whining about how it should have been her. Shut up, idiot. Be glad you were guarding that bomb. Shep, being a good commander, makes sure to help her with her survivor's guilt, regardless of his annoyance with her. Now, just before you met up with Sovereign, you also found a Prothean beacon and got some more info and the sexy and useful Liora does her sexy blue mind trick and distills down all those Prothean visions into something that makes sense. And you find out that the conduit is on Isles. You still don't know what the conduit is, but you definitely know it's there and you have to use the Mew Relay to get there. The next council call is one that can infuriate players. However, think about this. What concrete proof does Shepard have about the Reapers? Yeah, you talk to Sovereign, but they don't really know what a Reaper is. They didn't have that vision. For all they know, it's a Geth ship, and later games will have the council say it was one. Because once again, they didn't talk to him, and Sovereign didn't talk to them. The council, of course, says they don't believe him about the Reapers. Shep's argument isn't very strong, and he tells them to take it on faith. But rightly, the council says they have to make decisions that affect trillions, aka quintillions, of lives, and they cannot rush out to stop something based upon visions. They still recognize Saren as a threat, and this makes sense, but a Reaper is kind of hard to swallow. Players can come to really hate the council for their seeming inability to trust Shepard, 
but it makes sense. And this is very similar to something that happens in Babylon 5. Many major characters learn of the coming of the shadows, but they tell no one about it and instead prepare in secret. Unto the point where a major species has their homeworld invaded and taken over by the shadows, and it's only until the shadows attack the rest of the galaxy that the major characters go public with their knowledge. And the reason is that they know no one would actually have believed them. And that makes sense. Ooh, spooky shadow aliens. Sure, I believe it. I want some of what they're smoking. Despite the council blowing Shepard off about his spooky space robots, Shep gets a message about a joint council fleet being assembled to fight Saren. And thus he heads back to the Citadel only to be told that going to Ilos is too dangerous and that he is having his ship impounded. This is awesome. This is something straight out of many sci-fi shows and books. Except you are the captain, or I mean, commander. If you romance Leora, you even get another cool relationship scene where she comes to console Shepard. She perks him up, and they almost kiss, but Joker interrupts at just the wrong time. Looks like he was a fan of Empire Strikes Back, the bastard. The reason for Joker's unfortunate interruption is that Captain Anderson wants to meet you in the club. Captain Anderson gets to do more than just act as an Obi-Wan kind of guy. He gets to show just how awesome he truly is. At the club, he offers to help Shep get his ship back. You get two choices. Anderson can go to Udina's office and get the lockdown lifted, or he can go to the Citadel control room. I chose the option that has him go to Udina's office so that Anderson's reputation can remain intact. And uh, it's quite satisfying to see that bastard Udina get smacked right in the face. You and the Normandy head out to face destiny yet again. So... The sex scene. For those who weren't there back in 2007, a certain news organization had some salacious things to say about Mass Effect, and the headline was, Sex Box? Hmm. This is a rather unfortunate call forward to the Twitter mobs of today. As you would expect, just like with the Twitter mobs, the newscaster knew absolutely nothing about Mass Effect, but said newscaster certainly knew it had the bad words and the bad stuff in it. Let's get busy. Liara, just before you go through the Mew Relay, will go to your quarters in search of the big ship's big D. The sex scene for Mass Effect is great. It's artistic instead of pornographic and does not get cringy. It shows just enough to let you know that Shep got him some. Arguably, Liara is the best sex scene, not just because her blue booty be fine, but she also joins with Shep in body and mind. The real good part about the scene is that it is brief and does not have stupid music or wonky animations. Sadly, later scenes would be less enjoyable as they would journey to the uncanny valley and be a major uh, boner killer. After the sexy time, you have a little bit of post-sexy time banter. For Astley, it's pretty bad, and she pretty much just says some annoying crap, Shep says annoying crap, and it's over. Liara, by contrast, says a lot of heartwarming stuff, Shepard says a lot of heartwarming stuff, and if you're a Mass Effect veteran, you will know that one of the lines that Liara says to you is repeated at the end of Mass Effect 3. So after some booty, we make it to Ilos, and you find out that the drop is gonna be tough. Astley makes a good case for booting her into the brig and giving her bread and water for four months. Joker overcomes her defeatist attitude and says that he can drop the Mako into a 20 meter drop zone. He does so, and Saren is withdrawn by Sovereign so he can fight another day. Saren's puppet is hiding inside a large facility, and you have to crack it open by finding a security terminal. Ilos is one of the coolest planets in the game. It has this magical vibe that I would call otherworldly, but it's already in other worlds, so it's got a vibe that is other universally, I guess? In short, it's bloody weird. You fight through decayed Prothean structures and eventually find the security room and get an ominous message. It's another example of, if you know, you know. You get the doors open, hop in the Mako, and once again, this is where that Yeti thing comes in handy. How cool is this? How big does this look? If you were walking, it would have lasted like five corridors. If you have Liara with you, she will fangirl all over those Prothean structures. And if you have Rex along as well, he will tell her to stay focused. You fight through some geth and meet Vigil. The thing about Mass Effect is that it never felt like a video game story. It feels like a sci-fi story in a video game, and Vigil cements that. He doesn't just give you two answers and tell you to stop Saren before it's too late. And thankfully, you don't fight him as he goes nuts spawning random robots. No, you walk to him and talk to him, and the voice acting, lighting, and music turn this into a scene instead of just a video game exposition dump. 
Vigil is one of the last Prothean AIs. He has stood Vigil over the facility you have been fighting through. It was hidden from all of Prothean society, and thus the Reapers couldn't find it. You learned that it took centuries for the Reapers to wipe out the Protheans. The Reapers have been culling the galaxy for millions of years, and not even the Protheans were able to figure out why. The Reapers used the Citadel as a giant mass relay to bring the Reaper species into the galaxy. After they do this, they shut down all the mass relays around the galaxy and cut off all of galactic civilization. Remember, FDL drives and mass relays are different from one another. A mass relay allows instantaneous transport, whereas FTL is much slower. The species of the galaxy understand FTL, but no one understands the mass relays. You learn from Vigil that during the Reaper invasion, everyone at his facility went into stasis, hoping to hide until the Reapers left. Sadly, it took so long for the Reapers to finally leave that Vigil started to run out of power and started shutting down life pods until only the 12 top scientists remained. Imagine that you are only 12 people in a dead galaxy. Instead of going insane due to the isolation, they instead built their own mass relay, the Conduit, and sabotaged the Citadel. Sovereign needs to send a signal to the Citadel to get the other Reapers on the march. But the Protheans sabotaged the organic machines called the Keepers so that the Sovereign signal would be ignored. Now, you and your epic crew have one final chance to stop the Reapers and save the galaxy and break the cycle of extinction. Thank you, Mako. You drive through some geth and race against time to the conduit. You get lots through space at superluminal speeds to face down Sovereign once and for all. <sighs> the Mako, the first character death in Mass Effect. Truly, we owe everything to its solid dependability, for its death gave us a fighting chance to forestall the wrath of the Reapers. Most of the game has been like a TV show. The final battle is like a bloody movie. Sovereign attacks the Citadel fleets, and we get some bloody epic space action, but it's even better. You fight through the Citadel to reach Sovereign, and just look at this level. It's amazing, and remember, two 2007. As of this recording, we are rocking 16 year old graphics here, people, and look at it! You continue to fight through the Citadel, and eventually you come upon the Council Chamber, and Saren is waiting for you. He says that he actually listened to Shep, but that Sovereign, the bastard, fully indoctrinated him. Shepard, being a good guy and a world class bullshitter, is able to get through the indoctrination. But in a scene that in 2007 was super bloody shocking, Saren regains control of himself just long enough for him to blow his brains out. Trust me, in 07, this was nothing short of jaw dropping. Few games had ever gone that far and none had had the level of story weight behind it. Saren in that moment goes from idiot villain that was in over his head to tragic villain that in the end went out with the honor befitting a specter. Few movies and few books get a villain this right, cementing Saren forever in the pantheon of great villains. Now, you have another Bioware choice that sadly kind of gets ruined in later games. Joker contacts you after he and the rest of the human fleet head to the Citadel to stop Sovereign, and you have to choose whether or not to save the Council fleet currently engaged in combat. It's not a binary choice either, you get three options. You can let the Council fleet get destroyed, you can save them, or you can hold the human fleets back to concentrate on Sovereign. Sadly, in later games, if you choose the third option, they will just assume you left the Council to die so that humanity can become Ascendant. This annoyed me to no end because I'm playing good guy Shep and not uh, of a Imperator Shep. In the very last battle of the game, Sovereign takes control of Saren's corpse and uses it to try and take it down. However, by this point, Shep and the dream team of Liara and Rex beat the crap out of Sovereign in short order. And this somehow takes Sovereign the ship's shields down so that the human fleet can finish him off. This scene here is very reminiscent of the scene at the very end of Knights of the Old Republic where the Republic fleet takes down the Starforge. And this battle right here looks damn impressive today, 14 years later. Sovereign's death throes smash up the council chamber, but you and your crew survive, and Shep, with his stomach wound of heroism, smile and stand tall while the music swells, and he gets to join the pantheon of great science fiction captains. 
even though he's a commander. The game concludes with you getting to appoint a human council leader. The game will give you two choices. You can appoint either Ambassador Udina or Captain Anderson. Sadly, this choice doesn't really change things as we go through the franchise, as Udina will later become the human counselor, and Anderson will go on to be an admiral. For the purposes of Mass Effect 1, I choose Anderson. And as the credits roll, we see the Normandy flying off into an uncertain future. And holy crap, the credits song is a work of art and really stimulates all sorts of feels. <sighs> EA Games, pay for everything. So yes, Bioware would be acquired by Electronic Arts. As you would expect, Mass Effect 1 became extraordinarily popular, and thus, a sequel was in order, and Mass Effect 2 would go on to be one of the most popular games in the entire Mass Effect franchise. Mass Effect 2 would indeed be a worthy successor to Mass Effect 1, and Mass Effect 3... Oh dearie me, Mass Effect 3 is a rather misunderstood game. It, in and of itself, is an excellent game, except for the last 10 minutes. The biggest problem with the Mass Effect sequels is the absolutely aggressive monetization. When you bought Mass Effect 1, you got the entire game, and DLC would later be released, and ultimately it wouldn't mean all that much. Mass Effect 2 and 3, on the other hand, ooh boy, Mass Effect 2? Paywall for two characters and a bunch of weapons and armors. Mass Effect 3, paywall for a character and some weapons and armors. And Mass Effect 3 would introduce a very ill-advised multiplayer system. But in all reality, the sequels to Mass Effect 1 were excellent games in their own right, and over the next year we'll be taking a look at both of them. As you would expect, Mass Effect 1 is by far my favorite game in the entire franchise. It has the best gameplay, it has the best characters, and it has the best story. So with that in mind, I should go. I should go. I should go? If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and please consider leaving a like or a comment as the algorithm desires your soul. And I want to thank all those fans who have supported this channel, both past and present.